So yeah, I, I knew very little about neuromorphic computing three weeks ago, but I will teach you what I have learned in three weeks. And as always, I have chosen a topic that is entirely too broad, so I will give you only a, a base level of it. Please ask me lots of questions at the end. Uh, and I'm going to exploit this first um, slide by telling you that neuromorphic computing just means brain-inspired computing. End of talk. No, we're gonna we're gonna jump it a little bit more. Uh, so let me start my timer. Um, so yeah, why might we want to turn to the brain um, to, you know, um, consider a different form of computing? Well, the brain has different. Um, uh, really cool features that we might want to exploit. The the first and most promising is the low power draw of brains. Our brains in particular run on about 20 watts, which is about that of a light bulb. If you contrast that to something like AlphaGo, it uses something in the megawatts or millions of watts. So uh, as edge becoming, uh, sorry, edge computing becomes more of a thing, we want things to, to run on an actual battery source uh, and not be plugged into the wall. Um, neurons are also, or brains themselves are actually, are very scalable. Um, so in nature, we see brains that are anywhere from a couple dozen neurons to uh, many billion neurons like our brains. Um, it seems trite to say, but brains are really good at real-time stuff. We experience the world in real time, but that's really hard for current computing. And uh, one, of the, one last feature that I found uh, that I never thought about before I started doing research for this talk is that with brains, there's no split between memory and compute. Um, the sort of structure holds the memory and does the computing at the same time. So you don't run into memory bottlenecks that exist in other architectures. So let's take a second and just contrast these different architectures a little bit. So in the von Neumann computing model with CPUs and deep learning with GPUs or TPUs, um, there is that memory shuffle. You do need to move memory from long-term storage um, to a short, a faster memory to move in and out of compute. But in neuromorphic computing, that doesn't exist. Everything's just kind of there, so you don't run into those bottlenecks. Um, also, as we're moving from deep learning to neuromorphic computing, um, we're taking advantage, we're still taking advantage of this nice um, feature of deep learning, which is that we have very parallel distributed localized computing, but the data type has, is changing. So uh, deep learning um, does computing every cycle with very dense values, whereas neuromorphic computing um, has values that are very sparse in both time and actual information. So that's where a lot of the power savings come from, is just simply doing less doing more with less. Um, but the thing I want to highlight is sort of the, in my mind, the biggest paradigm shift is the idea of getting rid of the synchronous clock. So in both von Neumann computing and deep learning, we, there's a synchronous clock that we need to actually sort of arrange things and keep them in step. And if something's running slowly, that is a bug, not a feature. But in neuromorphic computing, the only sense of time that we have because the entire system is asynchronous is human time, like wall time that you would see like on a wall clock. So it, that's very similar to the way that our brains work. Like they just receive input and they do stuff as they get it. So it's, it's a really big sort of, um, paradigm shift away from the computing that we've seen before. So what kind of software uh, can we do in a, in a neuromorphic way? The most common thing that I've seen is a spiking neural network, super similar to the neural networks that you've seen before. Um, the main difference is the kind of data that it processes. So uh, a normal deep neural network would use dense values, matrices, but these use something called a spike train, which is just spikes happening in time. And again, time being wall clock time, not a time step. Um, but like a, a normal neural network, you have input neurons that get um, aggregated in some way in, into an output neuron that has some sort of function to figure out whether it's going to activate or spike. Um, so these activations can happen both in space, if you get a lot of input neurons that are sort of firing at the same time, but they can also happen in time. So the this the spiking signal can kind of be collected by this output neuron and then fired off at a later time. So that allows us to do some really cool applications that are more 
um, time-based than what we've seen traditionally in deep neural networks, even with um, recurrent neural networks or things that are supposed to work well in time. Um, one last thing to point out here is that um, because we're only computing when we get a spike, again, we're doing less. And these computations are often replacing something that's more complex with something that's less complex. So a lot of the multiplications in the scheme are replaced with addition, which is really easy to do on hardware. You just kind of add currents together. So again, doing less to get those um, savings. So these spiking neural networks are cool in theory, but they really only shine on um, neuromorphic hardware. So there are, is no commercially available neuromorphic hardware right now, which sucks and makes me really sad. Um, but some big players have tried um, and are still, some of them are still making stuff. So IBM made a chip in like the early 2010s that was kind of a big deal. They did a thing with DARPA, but I don't think they're making it anymore. Um, whereas the Intel Luigi chip is actually going to be released as a commercial chip this year, which I'm really stoked about. So we can talk about Luigi because I'm told that IBM sucks. Um, the the um, Luigi chip is actually a, a 2D grid of neuromorphic cores, and each core can represent around a thousand neurons. And these cores are built up into the Luigi chip. So for reference, each Luigi chip um, can represent about 130,000 neurons, which is about the number of neurons that a fruit fly has. But um, because of this like highly um, grid-like structure, um, you can arrange these chips into boards and rack mount these boards into systems that can have upwards of 100 million neurons. And then we're getting into the realm of like fruit bats and mole rats and small mammals. Um, for reference, humans have 86 billion neurons. So there's a little bit more to go before we can actually get sort of the, even just the neuronal complexity of, of human beings, but, but we're getting there. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'll stop there actually for now because I think our, our timing was slightly off. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, that was a super, super fast um, jaunt through neuromorphic computing. So please ask me very specific questions and I will do my best to answer them. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, er everyone do this <laughs> as, the, uh, uh, as the clapping. Uh, if you do have a question, could you just raise your hands through the uh, like reactions button? It'll be easier for me to track. Um, I guess I will go start. I'm gonna set the the timer for for let's say what what do we want to do? Let's say 12 minutes. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I'm kind of curious about is when we're talking about other sorts of like semi theoretical. Uh, computer science, there's often, you know, some reason or some algorithm uh, that can be done in this new type of hardware that can't be done in, uh, you know, current hardware or it's very slow. So I'm thinking about like quantum uh, computing has a lot of optimization potential. Uh, is there sort of like a killer algorithm for neuromorphic computing? Or have like, has there been enough research that kind of tells us like where we should be going with this? Um, from what I can tell, not yet. Um, a lot of the, the research has been focused on um, sort of re-implementing existing um, algorithms in neuromorphic hardware, um, and especially translating deep neural networks into neuromorphic hardware, just to just to show the the energy savings. Um, it's difficult because there is no commercially available chip. There needs to be some sort of reason to build um, or to make the investment to build these chips. So I think, for the most part, um, they focused on just proving the the worth up front. Um, but a lot of the the talks that I sort of listened to in preparation for this were talking about like, you know, we need some really good neuromorphic algorithms. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of nice to just on a, on a slight tangent, because these things are so much like brains, um, we can also test hypotheses about how neuroscience works. So hopefully they can go hand in hand of like, maybe we'll learn more about neuroscience, which will help us do better computing so we can learn more about neuroscience. Um, I'm interested in both of these things. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and next question will be Bruce, then Payam, and then Yifei. 
Uh, you talked about the number of neurons, but I don't think you talked about the number of synapses. Uh, can you say something about that? I did not. Um, and I have lost my speaker notes, but it, uh, in, <laughs> <laughs> roughly speaking, um, each neuron more, each neuron connects roughly to a thousand other neurons. Um, so the, the, it's about like that order of magnitude more in terms uh, of the number of synapses for, for any given number of neurons. How does that compare to the brain? It's about the same. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, like on average, um, brains connect, or sorry, neurons connect to a hundred to a thousand other neurons. Cool. Thanks. Should I go ahead with my question? Yes. Um, yeah. So my question is somewhat related to what Bruce just raised. Uh, so in your, I guess, introductory slide, you you were sort of outlining differences between brain and current chips. Uh, so one of them was the the integration, close integration between memory and compute. I'm wondering how did how do they go about achieving this in these new chips, or even maybe stepping a little bit back from that. Uh, I mean, I guess one of the features of the brain is is the shape, right? It's 3D it's in a way so that you can connect everything to everything or many things to many things. But these chips that you showed, they're all like flat, like normal computer chips. How do they handle these interconnections between the different neurons? Yeah, that the um, the hardware question I don't know as well. From what I can tell of the the Weehee chips, it's just a big routing problem. So if you can shuttle information to where you need it to go in a pretty speedy way and just look it up, that that's kind of where these chips excel. Um, the the team that's working on developing these chips are actually like ex packet routing people <laughs> who have been repurposed into doing neuro neuromorphic hardware design. Um, but in general, brains take advantage of locality um, quite quite a bit. Um, there are like certain neurons that will talk to neurons on the like physically other side of the brain, but that doesn't happen often. Um, often there's sort of a cascade from brain region to brain region. So you'll see on these neuromorphic um, boards, if you're looking at it, you'll see kind of like patterns of activity that go across, or so I'm told, um, by by the the people who have built this hardware. Did I answer all of your questions? Yeah, I feel like. Yes, I, I think so. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And you think? You're on mute, Yife. Yeah, uh, sorry. Also related to what uh, Bruce and Payam asked. Um, so I, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a, f a feature of um, how brains work is that the connections can grow and, and die, right? They're dynamic over time. Um, is there any sign yet of how, you know, neuromorphic computing will handle this or um, or maybe it's even already um, emulated in some current neural network architectures? Yeah, um, the, the vague sort of high level um, explanation that I've seen is adaptive learning rules. Um, so, so this is a, a function of the design, this idea that, you know, you're going to have um, hardware that changes over time, which is why these, these neuromorphic chips are just like complete grids. There's no sense of like exact routing. It's just kind of a bare bones chip. Um, there are also... Um, applications that are built on top of FPGAs um, in a like a really for a really small sense and that that sort of gives you the idea that you can have something that's like pretty bare bones to start fully programmable and just kind of build something um, on top of it. So you can basically build and delete I mean make and delete arbitrary connections between any um, well neurons any pair of neurons whatsoever. I believe so. I don't know the, the details of it. Um, generally speaking, the dynamics between neurons are modeled as uh, dynamical systems, but those they can be dy like dynamical systems that have that aren't like closed forms. So they can change and morph and adapt over time. But um, detail wise, I, I think that th there are some other fancy um, computing tricks to do that, but I didn't dive too far into the software that way. It, it has I have been told in pitches that it can be done. Okay. Cool. Thank you. And we probably have time for maybe one or two uh, more questions if anyone else has one. All right. Well, maybe I'll jump in and say, yeah. 
do you see any connection between this architecture and, and the cortical columns that our friend Jess Hawkins is so interested in and likes to promote? Yeah, this is more of a like abstracting away different brain regions um, mm. in, into just the idea of neurons. But um, there, there is a, a cool thing. Hold on, if I if I share my screen briefly again, because I was hoping you might ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a plant. <laughs> yeah. So I I had some cool applications in case anyone Ooh. asked, but um, but this one on the left is a the world's largest brain simulation. It is called Spawn. Um, it's, it stands for a Semantic Pointer Architecture Unified Network, and it was built on using um, spiking neural networks, not on neuromorphic hardware, but it, it emulates or it um, models 24 different brain regions. And this, this architecture uses the idea of a semantic pointer, which is kind of like a word vector, but for a concept. So imagine that you can have a concept vector that's shared between audition and vision and taste. Um, so kind of related to, um, like cortical columns or like um, groups of them that convey a, a little concept uh, in, mm -hmm. in the, the Jeff Hawkins sense, which is what got me really excited that we were talking about before. So yeah, um, there, there is, there is some connection there. It's all, it's all coming together. Okay, good. I see Doc, you for hand up. So uh, you'll be the last, last is, questioner. Is that then like a word embedding? Yes, it, it has very similar features um, in terms of like locality and things being um, close to each other, but it's, it's a little bit more broad and can be shared between different kinds of input that are coming in and can be a little bit more fuzzy <laughs> than a word. Um, yeah. All right, well, let's give another uh, round of applause uh, visually for uh, Julie. Uh, thank you so much. and. Uh, Next, I believe, <laughs> I wrote this down, uh, we have Robin, who is uh, going to talk to us about AI agents and the economy, or economics. Uh, thank you, Matt, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I am going to share my screen and present, can you guys see this? Is this visible okay? Okay, I will take that as a maybe. Can you guys hear me? Yes, it's all good. All right, <laughs> all right, great, awesome. Okay, so uh, AI agents and economics. So, how do does the presence of truly intelligent agents uh, affect the basic assumptions of economics, and what does that mean? So. Yeah, implications, speculations, and risks. I'm going to mix a bunch of obvious things with a bunch of uh, guesses, and I hope you enjoy. So first of all, uh, economists talk about the factors of production. Uh, in an AI context, you can kind of reimagine the factors of, of production, resources and land, uh, maybe being data, maybe capital is more about compute, software. Eh, if it's open source, maybe it's not so much capital. Um, but then AI agents can kind of directly, uh, as we go further in time, uh, replace more and more of the stack starting with the worker we talked about that a lot uh but then moving to the entrepreneur you know there's a, a famous uh book on the internet called mana about how ai first ev may evolve in the future and it talks about the first main application as being a manager of a, of a fast food restaurant uh and then to owners ai agents as numbers company numbered companies um economists talk about ai as a general purpose technology this is another use of the phrase gpt but they mean general purpose technology like electricity that kind of transforms all the assumptions of uh, how thing, uh, things are produced and, uh, and invention itself. And then uh, if, if workers are replaced, we'll see the, the, the typical um, interplay between households and firms get interrupted here with wages uh, not being necessary anymore. So McKinsey says, now, now that we have, have AI, well, now with AI, we have capital that learns. When we look at uh, employment displacement, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about this already, but if you look a little bit closer, you know, a lot of uh, papers that, that talk about employment displacement refer to Osborne and Frey 2013, and they analyze all the different t t job types and how probable they are to be uh, computerized in a, in a certain uh, time frame. 
and they actually categorize the jobs in great detail. But they say that these three factors uh, will keep jobs, uh, certain jobs relevant, social intelligence, creativity, and perception and manipulation. But this, this paper doesn't really take into account some, uh, some recent developments, including uh, you know, people who are, uh, who are researching directly um, social intelligence and AI, uh, creative AI, recent advances in creative AI, uh, including generative models, and then uh, recent uh, advances in, in our own robotics. Another angle here is there's this agency dilemma. You know, when you open Facebook, uh, you have the sense of a user agent, that's your browser, but really, it's not really acting on your behalf. If you look, open up your browser when you're on Facebook, it does, it's doing all this stuff that's not really in your best interest. Uh, so it's not really an, you're an agent under your control. Uh, and so Wagner uh, talked about uh, how users and AI providers have this strange relationship and this kind of asymmetrical relationship uh, but, but I guess what I'm saying here is that over time, we, we should have our own agents that act truly on our behalf, and they'll end up interacting with firm agents. And so the market between consumer and firms will kind of be subsumed by this new market between agents acting on each other's behalf. But really, there's this other um, entity here, the agent provider, that kind of controls the whole thing. So how we handle that, ag that agency dilemma, I think, is going to be more important moving forward. The geopolitical angle here is that uh, AI is really not very well distributed, evenly distributed. Um, some some countries have a lot more in terms of uh, AI research, uh, the chart below showing. Uh, and of course, this is a very small number of countries compared to most countries in the world I don't think would, would show up on this chart at all. Uh, if you look at industrial robotics, uh, China accounts for you know, uh, a huge amount of the uh, industrial robotics installations. And these are still dumb robots, but uh, projecting these two things forward, uh, we could see a very uneven landscape. And that, and how important is that? Well, some people think that's super important. Um, this map is showing uh, about how much of people's jobs can be automated. And that's also very uneven. So overall, there's, you can, we can say there's different types of economic actors and they coordinate using these different types of mechanisms. And so what I'm saying here is that uh, one potential outcome of, of AI agents uh, participating more in the economy is that we're moving more of the, shifting more of the power away from, from uh, directly from individuals uh, and more to these other more abstract entities um, that can, that that will that will utilize these agents, and the, and and will also uh, shift the dominant mechanisms more towards the mechanisms that are uh, suitable for AI agents, and away from the uh, living things, and from ethical uh, mechanism, which is how we would treat our our communities. So I think there's uh, things we can do. This is not all doom and gloom, um, but I think we, as part of the data science community, um, I think we, and, and people who understand these issues, have a obligation to uh, raise awareness um, in terms of informing citizens, uh, the media and policymakers and economists. I mean, you know, a lot of uh, economic thinking about this stuff is pretty shallow, to be honest, I think. So uh, encouraging the conversation, I think is really important. In terms of labor displacement, there's specific steps that we can take as a society to get ready for that. Uh, definitely including uh, figuring out UBI and, and education. In terms of the agency dilemma, I think it's important that we uh, have the right laws in place and also some technical solutions in terms of transparency and making sure that the agents that are uh, that we have agents that really work for us, unlike today's browsers, for example. If today's browsers were AI enabled, I don't think it'd be a good thing for us. They'd still be working on behalf of facebook.com when we were logged into that. Um, geopolitically, I think we we really wanna invest in the, the ecosystem of, of Canadian AI. And, uh, and in terms of the actors and mechanisms, things we want, I think we really want AI that advances the ethical coordination type and that promotes rights for for uh, living things, and doesn't get confused about um, 
uh, like basically pr promotes right, rights of actual living things over abstract entities, uh, and also really promotes uh, decentralized AI uh, to avoid this kind of uh, monopoly type situation. And yeah, I, I looked through a bunch of sources uh, for this. I'm not an economist, uh, but I think that this stuff's really important. So I looked through a bunch of sources and um, yeah, I'd be glad to hear your feedback. Oh, also, I'll just point out a couple things. Um, Jess Whittlestone uh, will be on my podcast uh, in a couple weeks uh, with the societal implications of deep reinforcement learning, which was one of the things that motivated me for this talk. Thank you. Nice. The clapping, etc. cetera. Uh, and here's just a freebie. Uh, tell me about your podcast. Uh, also, anyone who has a, a question, please just uh, raise your hand. Uh, you know. Oh yeah. Thank, thanks, uh, Matthew. Yeah. So talk RL podcast is, uh, I, is interviews with reinforcement learning, uh, researchers, uh, both technical and now getting more into, uh, political economy and, uh, societal implications and things like that. Nice. All right. Uh, so Julie and then Kaya. Yeah. You might be really uniquely suited to answer this question. Um, what is the the state of investment in the Canadian AI ecosystem right now? Um, how do we sort of compare to other countries and, you know, it, yeah, how do we fare? Um, I don't have a really strong answer for you, but uh, I think there's, I think there's the, uh, the bull case and the bear case. And the bull case is the, the positive side of it is that we have some of the best uh, AI research institutions and definitely per capita up in Canada. And we have leading researchers up here with best, best in the world. Um, on the other hand, and there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of great startups and I, I don't have the numbers for it right now, but there's a, there's a, a like a, a huge ecosystem. On the other hand, I think anyone who's ser is really paying attention to the industry will say that there's a, a brain drain uh, the best people get sucked up into industry in the U.S., and a lot of the great researchers up here are on the, the payroll of U.S. Co corporations. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, Robin. Uh, I'm just really intrigued by that uh, last thing you mentioned about the societal implication of the deep RL. Uh, so I'll definitely listen to the podcast, but can you give a little uh, preview? Is that going beyond like uh, just bandits and recommender systems or do you mean something different? Yeah, so this is Jess Whittlestone um, and she uh, and sh so she wrote this paper where, where she goes in more depth about, yeah, not just bandits and recommenders, but, you know, robotics and uh, and basically how deep RL means uh, truly intelligent robots and, and systems in, in a way that uh, most people who've been planning around this stuff aren't really quite ready for. Are we close? I haven't seen any new thing that suggests we are anywhere close to that. <laughs> well, close on what dimension? Like close on a generational level? Yeah, absolutely. Well, intelligent uh, robots. In like, next year? No, intelligent robots. Is there any sign that we are anywhere close to even thinking that it's possible to make them? Like RL, as you know, more than I do, is not doing what, what sort of hype that it's doing, right? Yeah, I guess my view on that is that there's certain strands of work that haven't fully come together yet. And then we will see them come together and then we will see some nonlinear change in capabilities of systems. I agree that today's systems are kind of laughably bad. Uh, but where I'm coming from is that there will be some nonlinear uh, jumps in progress when these certain things, certain threads that haven't kind of woven together yet, finally weave together. Cool. Thank you. Ducky? So uh, you had, in, when you were answering Julie's question, you mentioned that there were centers of excellence in Canada for AI. Are those in fact all in Toronto and Montreal? Or do we have anything out here that's good that's a great question i i'm not i'm not going to be any kind of authority on that uh but there's the obvious ones um including milan a vector institute uh but then there is amy in alberta um and there's 
serious RL work that goes on there and all, 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 uh, all types of research that goes on there. But then, uh, but that's just on the, um, you know, the Institute side. Uh, and then there's, I, I can't really speak to what's happening in the private sector, uh, to be honest, but I, I know there's from the ecosystem, the strength of the ecosystem here, I know there's a lot of great stuff happening in Vancouver, but I wouldn't be more specific. I mean, let, let me add to that. UBC has a great uh, group of RL and robotics people, and I've been hanging out with them and, and they're really cool and they work, they do some uh, really challenging work with, uh, with robotics. Didn't all of UBC's faculty get hired by Google like three years ago? Did, or did they did they replace them all? Well, there's someone still there. I mean, I mean, Professor Vandepan is is uh, is there. I think he's been there for quite a while, and he's he's doing some cool stuff with our own robotics. And I and I can't. And I'm sure there's many more. Um, and they may have uh, you know positions at, at companies as, at the same time as as being faculty there. Now Frank Wood is there. He's world class in probabilistic uh, programming. Jeff Kloon is another example. All right, we, we probably have time for another uh, one or two questions if anyone else would like to ask. Oop. All right, well, uh, we'll end this. Robin, thanks once again uh, for this insightful talk. And uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what else to say. Give me some food for thought. Thanks. Uh, and next up, we have Sam, who uh, you have a very long, uh, a very long uh, talk title, so uh, you're going to have to say it. <laughs> oh. Where'd Sam go? <laughs> I, I was just saying, I'm sharing my screen share. Sorry, starting my screen. Okay, yeah, yeah, no problem. I am always on a double mute, so it takes a few seconds for me to. Oh, good. Can anyone, everyone see? Yes. And something's Fantastic. loading in. Is it all loaded? Uh, yeah, looks good. Perfect. Um, I. This was three weeks ago, um, and I was interested in doing this. Uh, Matt has always recommended that this is a good way to, you know, learn to present in the group. So I took the challenge and I took this really long paper, Conditional Generative Adversarial Network for Gene Expression Inference. Um, mind me, I have no idea of GANs, and so whatever I learned is just reading this paper. Um, and I gave itself a, this name, which is much more human readable, um, an imitation game for genes. Uh, ironically, this plays really well with the 1950 study by Alan M. Turing about the imitation game where you know, you have to distinguish between two people, and then you have one guy who's a discriminator. So I thought there was this interesting connection. If other people don't see it, it's okay. I saw, I thought it was funny. Um, so why this paper? Um, well, genes control everything. Um, understanding genes is exist existential, uh, because even death is controlled by genes. Um, and Trying to understand all of this can get super expensive. The whole genome project was only recently uh, done, and then we realized that that's not sufficient. We have to look at the, the mRNA, which is also called the transcriptome. And that all of that process is expensive. So trying to even understand the expression of gene is super expensive. So if we could automate or create tools that could you know, predict or mimic uh, gene expression would be good. Um, so that line is just to add on to the fact that um, a lot of scientists do believe that genes play a, a huge role, you know, everything between life to death and between, and any tools to help mitigate costs would be great. Um, what is this paper about? So recently, um, a group project called LINK found that there are these particular group of genes, they call them landmark genes, L1000. Roughly a thousand of them kind of signal the expression of all the other genes in that cell, um, just like birds of feather flock together. 
Um, and so studying that would be a good start because then you're not spending money trying to understand the entire transcriptome or the, the genes expressing the cell. You just understand the thousand and then you can extrapolate from that. That's the logic. Um, there's more background um, in that the study itself, the, the L1000, they did it based on, um, on a simple uh, PCA first, and they identified these genes that explain 80% of the, the radiation. And so they expanded it to 1.3 million profiles. Um, and then when they did that, um, they fit the model using linear regressions. And they also found that these thousand genes pretty much kind of uh, reference genes for the expression profiles of the, the million genes, 1.3 million genes. So it was a good start. Um, but there are problems with this in that uh, linear, um, linear regression models are not very good in understanding um, things that are not linear. And, uh, and so we can use kernel-based systems, but those are also computer expensive. And so this group, uh, I think it's Chen et al. They created a deep um, gene expression learning model. Um, and they designed it such that it's a multitask regression problem. That, that did perform really well compared to the linear models. Um, but there was a limitation where they were using the mean square error as a loss function. And this sometimes tend to flatten out for players uh, because it's trying to fit it to the most common data points. Um, and then this paper, they're trying to address that by designing uh, a, a completely different architecture. Um, so hence the birth of this paper. The, the way this is designed is um, there is a, a, a novel conditional generator model. I can talk about that in the question why it's novel. Um, and it's basically a regression task. And they use three uh, gene expression data sets that's publicly available um, and then use that to make uh, the training and then prediction. The real goal is to correctly predict expression of the target genes just based on the thousand randomized genes. So that's that. Um, if I have time, I'll continue with the data. So what we see here is the first GEO data set. Uh, on, the, on the left side, we have the different methods uh, and the, the mean absolute error. And on the right side, this is a, a con concordance correlation. It's another measure to see how good the predictions are. And you can see that the, the generative GANs, uh, MAE was 0.2. It's roughly 10% better than the deep learning one and much, much better than the other linear uh, square regression models are like Similarly on the CCC. Um, and then they use the same training on GEO data and then see how well it performed on a completely different data. Oh, wait, I'm jumping, sorry. Um, completely different data. And then they also realized that it was doing fairly well um, it's only like a 5% difference compared to the, the D, but still it's a new data that it was not trained. Um, so I took this slide. This slide, they were just doing some optimizations. They were playing around to remove or add hidden layers or remove or add units. Um, and then they found that, you know, about three hidden layers was really optimal overall for the, the generative games. That is the architecture. Um, so you have your X are the landmark genes, Y are the targets you have to identify. Uh, they assumed it as a, a joint probability that was fed into the generator and the generator will you know, generate the Y hat and Y dash, um, Y hat dash. So it was trained such that at some point the, the target Y and the generated Y when they are um, and then they're fed into the loss function, um, how close is it to the target? And uh, that's the architecture. If I have time, I can continue on. Matt, should I? You got one minute. Okay. Uh, so that's the architecture. And then um, after the training, the predictions were done just from the generator uh, for uh, the targets. Um, these are some visualization of um, the, um, the gene clusters. Uh, what we see here on the bottom x-axis is the um, uh, different profiles, 20 profiles. 
and on the top are the thousand landmark genes. And each of the gray green lines are uh, either high expression or low expression. And uh, so that's landmark. On the bottom C here, you're uh, having a correlation against the landmark genes and the target genes. This is a bit crowded. So on D is a, it's an expanded shot where you have the 10 landmark genes mapping to 20 cluster genes. And it, it fairly maps like, so this gene and this gene, um, when they are correlating means that one and two are correlating from one to here. Uh, there are some that it did not do well, like five and 14 and 10. But overall, uh, this two was mapping the, the landmark genes to the target genes fairly well. You have five seconds. Okay, I think I'll wrap it up. Conclusion. Uh, the authors conclude that this model was much better than the previous model, which I tend to agree. Uh, and I'm happy to go on and talk about it more if, for the questions. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, clapping, shaking, etc. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, I'm curious about the, the target of this challenge, right? The, the sort of landmark genes. Now, I, with a little bit of my background, I would assume that these landmark genes are regulatory in some way, but given that they just did a PCA, I, I, I guess they didn't pull that out. Do you know why they, they chose these? Like, a thousand, like, why did they choose these specific genes? Did they, spe did they speculate that it had anything to do with like regulatory effects? Or uh, was it just like, this is the target that we're, we're aiming for, if we're not gonna discuss like why? Uh, honestly, Matt, that's an excellent question. I don't have an answer because I did not go back to check the, the Lynx project because the Lynx project is the one that did the landmark studies to identify the genes. But you might be almost right in that, yes, you are right, regulatory genes kind of are kind of background, they run everything. So mm -hmm. there's a highly likely chance. But then there's also um, the idea of, this is me extrapolating from my multiple biology background is, when you have genes on the same allele or on the same chromosome, they tend to express, right? So if you have neighbors, they might express. And so it could also be possible that these are the same genes on the same alleles or maybe on the same chromosome. So some mm -hmm. signal that's triggering there, the, the predecessor is probably triggering the, the one following. It mm -hmm. could be both ways, but honestly, I think that's a question I need to go back to check the next project. Okay, cool. Does anyone else have questions? Because I have a ton of like, like <laughs> sort of biologically based questions here uh, as well, but I don't want to take up everyone's time. All right, I'll just keep on asking. So the, the, the inputs and the, the outputs here, like it's, it's all trans, uh, transcriptomics, right? So the, the, the output, is that just like the big array of numbers that show like the, the number of like RNA transcripts that are being produced? Uh, and you know, it's like zero if there's no expression and then there's some amount. Is it like normalized in any way? It's normalized. They normalize. yeah, okay. So going back to, because they these guys did a really good job of making sure that their data is really matching the deep um, expression data back mm -hmm. to links. So they did a uh, quantile normalization. So the means are zeros and the unit standard deviation. And then um, and then they compared that normalized data set to this. Uh, but if you want to know the raw data itself, the, the range of gene expression was between four and 14 four being the lowest and 14 being the highest. And so that was the normalized uh, after uh, post-processing to zero mean and unit variance. Did I answer that? Yeah, no, I, I think so. Because yeah. it, it makes sense. I think if they did not normalize it, it will be some gunk coming up, right? Right, yeah. Do, do you see this being, oh, actually, Yifei, <laughs> uh, please. Um, go ask that's, that's fine. Um, that, go ahead. If, if we have time, I can wait. 
Oh no, there there, there will be time. Uh, but my my question was oh, this is more of a comment. My apologies. Um, like the way that this is typically seen, like the like when we think about the gene expression, et cetera, is as a graph of, of activations. Uh, and it, it doesn't seem like any of that information has been included here. Uh, could you imagine uh, an extension of this that actually takes into account the uh, the relationships we already know between, say, gene regulation and, and tra uh, transcripts? Mm. No, that's a very good question. So basically, you're saying that uh, right now we, we only have a binary scale. Could we have some kind of a gradient scale of like Expression yeah, yeah. It, it, essentially, like it, it, just as kind of almost like Bayesian priors. Like we, we think we know how these genes are related, etc. Uh, uh, what you said about allele distance is is a, like another thing that you would probably would want to encode uh, mm -hmm. as well, because you know uh, things can be related and not actually be like mechanistically related. But uh, Ife, yeah, please ask yeah, your yeah, question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry if I missed it, um, if you covered it and I missed it, I uh, was really distracted during the talk. Um, why was there any particular, any justification as to why they specifically use GANs? Um, also, um, it, uh, also, I missed what exactly the inputs are. Are they just the expressions of um, the landmark, land, landmark genes or certain other genes? Um, and in that case, yeah, as um, Matt mentioned, um, there's other data such as allele distance, et cetera, that would be relevant, um, you know, so and and so yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. No, um, yeah, and those two, I, I guess, would be related, um, the, the, the inputs and the architecture that um, used for prediction. So the the first thing that uh, it's it's kind of like a follow up basically the first landmark L thousand study they used linear regression models to do it right and so with linear regression um, we are only looking at I would say just the one uh, two dimensional space if there are representations along other axes we can't really capture it or if there are outliers and if they have influence and and Matt please come into correct me if I'm saying something wrong. Um, we can capture, but when we use something like um, um, a kernel-based system or a deep learning system where it can um, find, you know, uh, other patterns in the system, it is better. So that was the second logic. And so really quickly, kernel-based systems need a lot of compute. And so the, the previous authors went with uh, the deep learning system. But then again, for their loss function, they were using a mean square system, um, which had some smoothing of the, the results. I have to look at the data to understand why that was the case. And so these guys were just saying that issue by using the GANs, where you're you're basically generating uh, based on your input. And I'll tell about input in a minute. And essentially, they were saying because we are not um, we're not having the MSC as a loss function, our results are much more uh, robust and cleaner. In terms of input, what you're seeing here is the, the target and the landmark genes are, are paired together. And for the, for, the, uh, for the landmark gene, you're trying to generate a target gene. That's what the gene is doing. And then the determinant is trying to figure out how close is the, the target to the original target that was added for landmark gene? So in essence, the better the generator is becoming, the closer it is going to represent the um, the landmark to the target, and, and that's their logic. So they're saying that uh, we are able to mimic more of a, if you see X, you're probably going to see Y because of the landmark system, and in this case, if you see it through the GAN, then it's more realistic than trying to predict it through say, a linear uh, regression model or kernel-based systems. Is, is that, did I answer your question? Um, well, but why GANs, the GAN architecture specifically, um, as opposed to any other, you know, 
any other of so many um, yeah, they, deep they, learning architectures. Someone has used the, the deep expression, which is the, it's a deep learning architecture. And in the deep learning architecture, the loss function that they used was also a um, square, square error. And so these authors uh, claim that that's not a better way. And we needed something that would, um, you know, map out outliers in the pattern. I'm not, I'm not sure why they could have gone with another method, but they defined GAN as a better solution than the, the deep uh, gene X model or the, the network that was generated before. Yeah, that, I, I don't really know why they haven't gone with another technique. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is something we can definitely talk about after, but uh, mm -hmm. we, we don't have uh, time, but th there is kind of an interesting kind of answer to this, which is, look, it's because of the nonlinear nature of this problem uh, mm -hmm. that a lot of normal metrics uh, kind of fail here, because uh, things that look like they're not that far apart will actually be very far apart. Um, but um, that's everything, Sam. Thank you again uh, for presenting. Uh, what I think is a, a very challenging paper, so uh, uh, good on you. Uh, the, I, I've pulled out the paper myself, and now I'm really <laughs> interested in actually reading it. Uh, so thanks again. Uh, thanks, one more round of uh, shaking hands, clapping hands. Uh, and we have one more, one more talk, and this is Dan. And, oh, shoot, I don't have his... Um, I don't have the title of his talk. It is, load, 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 uh, Machine Learning in, in AI in Interstellar Colonization. Does everybody see the uh, presentation? I can see and hear you. Great. Yeah, so my name is Stan Mazer. I'm a machine learning engineer. I'm also formally an astrophysicist. And I'm interested in interstellar colonization because I'm working on a piece of science fiction. But uh, it turns out there's a lot of scientists and engineers that are kind that are working on trying to speculate about what a realistic interstellar colonization mission would look like. And one of the most interesting aspects of it is the AI requirements that you're going to have. So you you cannot solve this problem without very sophisticated, intelligent robots that can operate autonomously. So that's uh, what we're going to learn right now. And I'll just restart the time for myself. OK, so I'll talk about three phases of sort of technological development. The first is discovering potentially habitable exoplanets. And that work is going on right now, today. Uh, we'll talk about intelligent precursor probes. So these are unmanned missions. This is kind of a, a nearer future project, and then the actual colonization missions, which is more distant future. And that's the piece where you actually send humans to other stars to live permanently. Okay, so machine learning for exoplanet searching. Um, there's satellites that look at stars and they're looking for exoplanets around those stars. So what kind of signals are you looking for? Um, the most common one is transits. So this is where the exoplanet crosses in front of the star and you see a dip in the light curve from the loss of light. So 76% of exoplanets are found using that method. 19% uh, are found using wobbles. So that in this case, you're looking at the Doppler shift as the star wobbles back and forth because of the gravity of the exoplanet. And 2.4% of discoveries, they were looking at gravitational microlensing. So this is light actually bending around the exoplanet. And then in 1.2%, um, they're looking at directly imaging the exoplanet. So using all of these methods combined so far, there's been 4,383 confirmed exoplanet discoveries. And what all these methods have in common besides maybe direct images is that they're all signal processing problems where you're looking for a very specific signature, but perhaps a very subtle signature. And so machine learning is very useful at this type of problem. And it's used extensively in this research. So there's tons of papers about uh, different machine learning models. It's also something you could get into yourself if you're interested, because um, you can download Kepler and test data. These, these are the satellites that they use. And there's open source projects. Uh, one I'll talk about is the Nigraha pipeline, 
which you can find on GitHub. And this is a machine learning pipeline that can get you started discovering exoplanets yourself. So the next phase I'll talk about is sending AI probes. So often we, we think of sending probes uh, to other stars just to do passive observation. But if you're interested in doing a colonization mission, you probably want to do a lot more than just passively observe the star. So this probe would be responsible not only for assessing the habitability of the, the star system and the planets, but actually doing the terraforming, actually con constructing habitats, uh, maybe getting agriculture started, all of these things that you'd want. So the humans, when they arrive, are totally comfortable. So um, often we think of humans doing this work, but actually it's probably unmanned probes that get it all going. So what sort of responsibilities and roles would the AI have? Well, it's got to be a pretty good scientist because it's not going to know a lot about the environment there when it leaves because it'll only know what we can observe from Earth. Um, so it's going to have to formulate hypotheses and test those hypotheses and figure out what sort of resources are available and how to extract those resources and how to turn those resources into construction materials. Um, so tons of responsibilities around that. Uh, it'll have to do all its own navigation maneuvers. Uh, it'll have to monitor its own systems and do maintenance on itself. And it'll have to do all the designing and building of these biomes and habitats. It'll have to figure out appropriate sites to put habitats and stuff like that. So a huge number of decisions that it has to make totally autonomously because, and the reason it has to be totally autonomous is because the communication distance round trip to other stars is at least light years and maybe light decades or more, depending on how far away the star system is. So thinking about the first generation of interstellar probes is something that people are, are thinking about currently. And there's um, this one in particular is called Starship. And it's from a, a group called Breakthrough Initiatives. And the reason I bring up this one in particular is because I want to point out how small it is. So this is, uh, it kind of reminds me of a smartwatch. So the, the probe you're sending is a smartwatch to another star. And the reason they're sending such a small probe is because payload mass is very expensive. And when you think about this, you realize you can't send much computing payload for this very advanced artificial intelligence that you want. So the payload mass is expensive, the power is expensive, radiation shielding and cooling, all the stuff you need for big computers is expensive. So you can't send like a data center out to the other stars. You need something a lot lower powered, a lot lighter, uh, and it still has to be smart enough to do all the stuff we talked about. So maybe something like um, Julie's brain like computers would be helpful uh, for this. Okay, now we'll talk about actual colonization missions. And the, the first question I want to address is how many people are, do you need to send? So there's a lot of people estimating this number, but uh, this one here is 20,000 to 40,000 people. And this is trying to estimate kind of a comfortable number rather than a, a minimal number. But it's a realistic size of a mission uh, for colonization, 20,000 to 40,000. And so when you have that many people, it sort of excludes the possibility of sending them all on a really fast ship that gets there, you know, while they're still all young enough to, to do all the colonization work. So you're looking at other alternatives, maybe something like sending embryos or sending people in some sort of hibernation. If you choose those options, then your whole ship, your whole mission has to be totally autonomous because you don't have like a human workforce on the ship. There's other types of ships like uh, generation ships or world ships where you have uh, just generations of people living comfortably on the ship. Um, and then you do have a workforce, but some people have estimated the maintenance requirements on a big world ship like this. And it comes out to be uh, about three parts that you're replacing every second on the ship. And so you need a workforce of like 500,000 workers to do the maintenance on this ship. And it kind of makes sense. In normal engineering, we don't think about building really complex machines that have to be reliable over long periods of time. Um, so there's a lot of maintenance. Uh, I think I'm out of time. Matt's signaling me, but you can also ask me about uh, the role no, of AI. Keep going. You have another 20 seconds. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I wanted to bring up the point of geology. Um, when you get a small population of humans on board a, a, in sort of an isolated environment over many generations, you can lose knowledge. And so what, one type of knowledge that would be useful at the destination, but you'll probably lose is geology, just for one example. 
uh, if you're in the middle generation, you're going to be not very enthusiastic about learning to become an expert geologist. Um, so AI can play a role in teaching humans uh, stuff they need to know at their destination. That's going to be really hard to maintain knowledge about um, culturally on the ship. Okay. All right. So this is my uh, summary slide that I'll leave up for the question period. Okay. Excellent. Uh, perfect. And shake hands, clap. Thank you. Et cetera. Thank you. This was this is a really fun one. Um, and I'm going to ask you uh, probably a hard question. Uh, do you have like a, a favorite sci-fi book that touches on these sorts of ideas? Like, is there anything kind of inspiring you to to write and think about this? Well, I'm not much of a science fiction nerd. And I've embarked on this project to, to write some science fiction, but actually it's kind of unusual in that it's um, it's a story that's all about you know, scientists and engineers problem solving. And so I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not usually into fiction, but I feel like this is the kind of fiction, uh, if I'm gonna write something, it's gonna be this kind, more science than, than story and more science than characters. Nice. Um, so I'm not actually that familiar, but there's uh, uh, some stories that I'm reading, in particular world ship stories. So there's a story called Ark by Stephen Baxter and a story called Aurora by Stanley um what's his name stanley kim kim robinson yes yeah excellent uh i'm gonna go heather pam bruce and julie was the order that i saw that in so heather you want to go yeah so uh, that was really interesting um the starship that you showed that's insane it has so much stuff on it is is that available for people to buy like an arduino or something because you could do so much cool stuff with that or is it like a million dollars and only two of them exist yeah so this is a a proposal that's still in development for uh it's an interstellar spacecraft so it's not a consumer product um so yeah i, I don't know if they'll they'll they probably won't start out mass producing them, right? They'll probably start out with a, a few and, you know, start sending them. I'm not sure uh, what their mission plan is in terms of how many stars they want to try and cover with this technology. Um, I think they should fund it by selling them to the public to use <laughs> for cool things. That's well, really cool. It is, it, like, you can imagine that it might be something they would be interested in giving to researchers to, you know, help them with their planning and help them with their development and make sure the mission goes well. So maybe it is something that will be available to to play with if you have the right connections. I don't That's know. So cool. Thank you. Sam? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. It was a very interesting talk. I just wanted to make a couple of comments because uh, so for the for the next week or so, I still work at MDA, which is trying to do some of these things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they're working on is the Canada on 3, which needs to be increasingly more autonomous because it's closer to the moon, so there's going to be a lot of times where it can't be controlled manually. Um, so I just wanted to say, so first of all, the, the, these, this distinction was completely lost on me until somebody pointed it out to me. Autonomous does not mean AI. They're not synonymous. There's a lot mm -hmm. of autonomous things that have nothing to do with AI, and actually nobody wants to put AI that learns in space. That's, nobody wants to do it. Uh, so people might want it, might be open to training AI systems and then just putting it for inference on a spaceship. Uh, but even that is, I don't think anybody has done it yet. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is all technology in space is at least 10, 15 years behind the technology we have on Earth. Because when you put it on a spaceship and it needs to operate for like a decade or so, you really 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 conservative like you don't take any chances at all everything is ancient uh i think it's just running on code that probably nobody works with on earth anymore um yeah so i'm just a little bit skeptical that they're going to get these things together but uh i hope they do <laughs> yeah you. and today the, the these missions are decades as you say but uh if you're sending a world ship type of mission that could be like a 2000 year mission that where everything needs to be reliable throughout that entire 2000 years. <laughs> so it's an incredible, it's yeah, unlike anything we do in engineering today. Bruce was next. Yeah, I have a very specific question. You may or may not know the answer to this, but 
it, it has to do with how long it takes to get there. So if you want to send humans 10 light years away, it, it seems like because they're humans, you can maybe only accelerate at 1G and maybe you get halfway there and you decelerate at 1G. So the question is, how long does that take? And do relativistic effects come into it so that people experience it on that spaceship as a, you know, a different time from whatever? Yeah, so... so what, what would be the subjective time experienced by those people? Yeah, um, it's a good question. So the there is a limit to the number of Gs you can have. And so 1G is comfortable, right? Because 1G gives you Earth-like artificial gravity. And mm -hmm. so if you're um, accelerating 1G, that's comfortable for a human. Um, but you might have a period of the trip that where you accelerate a lot faster, for example, right at the beginning, um, where you subject humans to uncomfortable Gs um, to get them going faster. But actually for an interstellar mission, 1G is quite a lot of acceleration. Like it gets you go going pretty fast when you have it over a long period of time. Um, and I don't, I don't have the calculations in front of me to, to know like how long that trip is like, to the nearest star at one, one G acceleration and then one G deceleration. Um, it'd be fairly simple to work out. Mm. But you also can, in principle, um, yeah, you get to relativistic times, and you can get, you can travel ten light years in less than ten light years from the perspective of the people on the ship. Yeah. So just because a star is 10 light years away doesn't mean it takes you 10 years to get there necessarily, depending on uh, whether or not you can accelerate fast enough. Yeah. Cool. And Julie? Thanks, Dan. That was fun. Um, my my question is kind of related to what Robin put in the, the comments and, and kind of what Payam was saying. But once, like, say you have a probe that you've launched and it's kind of reached its destination, um, is there any hope of updating it by that point? Because presumably, like, I, I don't know, I guess the question is, is it more economical if you need to do some sort of updating to send another probe, given some updated knowledge? Or is there any hope of, of um, updating it remotely? Is that even faster or better? Yeah, so the fastest way is to up, probably update it remotely. And like interstellar communications is actually probably the easiest part of this problem. Uh, it's like today's technology, we have the, enough technology, like it's just radio, right? Um, so you communicate um, with radio and it's just a matter of focusing it and giving it enough power, but it's not, um, not definitely not the hardest challenge. So yeah, you can update uh, and communicate with these probes, the, the problem is the round trip um, communication time being years long. So once you send out your update, the probe won't receive it for years. Cool, thanks. Uh, probably enough time for one or two more questions. Oh, Sam. Dan, how it? Question. This is more so about the, the, the ship itself. In that resource margin is going to be a, a big challenge too, right? Because you have to make sure that you have enough materials to repair, to rebuild, and keep things going in, in a long uh, trip like that. Right? How would that be considered? Because that adds mass to the, the entire trip too, right? Not just the humans. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. So I said earlier that you're, rep you're replacing three parts per second. And if your plan is to just have a giant payload of replacement parts for everything, um, that's not a particularly good plan because that's a lot of mass that you have to send up. Um, so you're probably looking at trying to have some sort of really efficient recycling program where you know, arbitrary parts can be become other arbitrary parts through some recycling process. Um, but it's probably a recycling process unlike the technology we have today. Um, so that you, you're doing a lot more part replacements and maintenance with a lot less overall mass. Thanks, Dan. Um, if I have one more question, can I go, Matt? Yeah, go for it. And then um, Ducky, and then uh, we're done. All right. And then also resource generation, like there are replenishable and non-replenishable. And so how would we tackle that? And also fuel. Right. I know sometimes we could have like sales and short burst pulses, they have new technologies, but 
I'm, I just want to pick your brain on how that would be all working. Yeah, so in, a, in an interstellar mission, um, you generally need to launch with the, all the payload that you need for the entire mission because um, there's not many resources along the way to, um, to harvest. With the exception of if you need some protons or something, you can get them from the interstellar medium, um, but maybe not as many as you'd like to have. So you're generally trying to send up all the fuel you need uh, right at the beginning of the mission uh, and all, yeah, all the materials you need for all the repairs you're going to do and everything you need to, if you need agriculture on the ship, uh, all mm -hmm. that stuff has to go as part of the initial mission planning. Uh, so that's, that is a, a giant challenge of all this as well. Thank you. And Ducky? So you were talking about replacing parts and how this is complicated on a, on a long mission. I want to point out that Voyager went past Jupiter in, I think, 1975, 1976. And it was still functioning for a long time. I think they finally stopped listening to it five years ago or so. So I don't, I don't think you necessarily need to have a huge array of spare parts or a recycling thing if it's only going to be 100 years or so that we have demonstrated we can build things that are reliable for a very long time. That's all. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, the counterpoint to that is, is how simple Voyager is compared to uh, a habitat for humans. So humans don't have to live aboard Voyager. Oh, um, uh, sorry. I didn't mean for the actual colonization, but for the probes. Yeah. Yeah, so the, it, it's a lot... It's a lot simpler to send a probe because you're not trying to maintain life. And also your your tolerances can, in terms of uh, failures can be a lot. Like if you lose a probe, what big deal? You build another one and send it out. But if you lose a 40,000 person colony ship because of a systems failure, that's a big deal. So yeah, your your tolerance to failure becomes a lot lower in that situation. All right. We can continue discussing uh, after, but I just wanted to thank all of the speakers once again. Uh, these are all really great talks. Uh, a lot of food for thought here. So again, shake, clap, <laughs> put up uh, emojis in the Zoom. Uh, this is really great. And uh, uh, Bruce, we can probably cut off the uh, recording now. Um, Will do. Awesome.